Great. And looking back 80 years, um, your childhood, you know, growing up, joining the military, being involved in the Nigerian Civil War, being involved at every level of governance in Nigeria in the last 50 years or, or, or more, what are the things that stand out for you looking back? Stand out for me? Yes. What are the memories? Any memories, fond memories, some things that you look back and say, hmm, shouldn't have done that. Oh, I'm happy about that. No, I think one thing that if I look back, I keep on saying I wished my parents were alive to see such a level of my development. Hmm. Uh, I lost them when I was in my formative years. By the time I was 14, I lost the two parents. And every day it comes to me that I wished one of them or both of them were alive when I became a military officer. Hmm. Did that, did losing them at a young age, at 14, did it affect you in any way? Did it form your world view? Did it uh, impact on how you relate to people, you know, and all of that? How did their passing on at such an early age affect you? Yeah, I, I, I used to, to hear them talking. They were always wishing me well. They, they were confident that... Um, I will one day grow up to be somebody within the community. And uh, as God will have it, they didn't get to see me grow up within the community. Mm. Of course, you have, you, you've turned out to be more than uh, just More than someone, the expectations. More than the expectations, mm -hmm. you would say. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about, I mean, you, you can't talk about the history of Nigeria without you know, talking about the role that you have played. All the way back, to 1966 when the first coup, you know, happened. And then, of course, you had to, uh, you know, intervene at some level. In 1976, you quashed the coup, you know, against uh, the late Muritala, uh, Muritala Mohammed mm -hmm. and all of, you know, iconic moments, iconic periods. Uh, talk to us about that fight that you had to fight to keep Nigeria one and the fact that today, Nigeria is still struggling with the issue of unity. Well, I think uh, at that time, don't forget, the first problem started in 1966. Nigeria was six years old as an independent country. Mm. Uh, we were just struggling. We were trying to be a nation. We haven't fully become, um, I, how do I call it? We are not, we are just a group of people mm -hmm. in an environment, geographical environment called Nigeria. But we were not, I didn't believe we built a nation. And that is the major problem. That is why there were instability within the country um then this culminated into a civil war and uh all developing countries i think had to go through that process i was quite aware of this and uh, convinced that this is all developing country especially in africa they had to go through this africa latin america and so on and so forth. so we are not an exception so you think the civil war was not um, inevitable in, in your... No, if you, if you watch, before the civil war, we had a lot of problems. We had instability in the government, in the system. We had uh, tea riots. We had Operation Wetier. We had a lot of stability operations in the country. This culminated into the civil war. Mm -hmm. So it didn't come to us as a surprise. And let, let me back up just a little, and then we'll talk about why Nigeria is still struggling with, you know, gelling together as one nation 
where nobody's thinking, I'm Hausa, I'm Fulani, I'm Igbo, I'm Yoruba, I'm, you know. Let's talk about the, your role in the military and then, of course, the, the, the role of the military in governance over the years until 1999. Mm -hmm. A lot of people argue that the incursion of the military into, you know, uh, governance set Nigeria back decades, if not centuries. What's your thought on that? Do you think the military coming in to power was a great setback for Nigeria? Well, I saw the military's intervention as part of developing process in a developing country like Nigeria. Um, you, I can take you back to, say, the whole continent of Africa, sometimes in 1952, military started intervening in governance in Africa. 52 was Egypt. And then from Egypt, this started going through to other countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, is, it was a war then to stage a coup in a lot of these countries. And we couldn't be an exception. We had officers who were trained, officers who were highly educated, mm -hmm and following the events that were happening in other countries. So it's not unusual to develop people who have this sort of kind thinking. Mentality. About. That's right. Mm. And I think we came in at the time that these things are happening in, throughout the world. Well, they were acceptable. Yeah. Let me go to that question that I need to ask you. Fundamentally, Nigeria is still struggling to be a nation. What do you think is wrong at the base that the, the Fulani man doesn't seem to have a sense of belonging, the Igbo man doesn't, the Yoruba doesn't, everybody's thinking about their own part of the country? What do you think is fundamentally responsible for that? On the contrary, I think, uh, again, if you look back, if you take a place like Baga, mm -hmm. up in, in the northeast, mm -hmm. The Ibu man, the Yoruba man, travels up to Baga for trading. He lived very comfortable. He lived very well with the people around there. They do their normal trading and so on. Even politically, in Enugu, in the 50s, you had a Hausa man who was a male. If you go to Lagos, the same thing you have. Yorubas, Igbos, who are holding political appointments at local levels and live very well with the people. I think we, becoming elites, we did not succeed in imbibing that culture for the country. So we rather live with the culture that the European handed over to us mm. distinct northern Nigeria, eastern Nigeria, western Nigeria, and so on. Until such time when we had Middle Belt, oh, I'm sorry, um, what the name of this, in 1963, mm. Midwest. Yes, the Midwest region. So, but we did not mold ourselves as nation. So I feel very strongly that was what happened. We, the, the political elites then that were being developed, they ran back to their cocoon and accept that, oh yes, I have to be a able man to do this or that. And till today, unfortunately, the political class mm -hmm. are not really going into this very seriously and say, no, how do we build a nation? And that's a question I'd like to ask you. That's how right. do you think? I think we, we have to rewrite the narrative. We have to rewrite the narrative. How? Okay. Um, you are now arguing amongst yourselves on how to build political parties, for example. We knew it was doable because we did it. Mm -hmm. 
We had political parties that were being led by people who were from other parts of the country. And they blended very well. They talked to people, they had the same common vision about this country, what they wanted the country to be. And I give you an example. I believe in free market economy. So anybody who will come to talk, not to talk about free market economy, mm. I wouldn't talk with him because we don't have core values in the country. These are core values beyond which nobody is going to allow you to do anything. And the politicians, the elites, all, I think, we have to blame in this. So, Your Excellency, would you say then, based on what you have just said, that the tyranny of the elite is what has contributed, for example, to the security situation that Nigeria finds itself in right now. There's banditry, kidnapping, there's terrorism in the Northeast, banditry in the Northwest, a secessionist sentiments in the Southeast, even in the Southwest, secessionist sentiments, banditry also, kidnapping all across the country. What do you think is a fundamental problem and what is the way out of this vicious cycle of uh, insecurity? I think the problem is leadership. The, there is a disconnect between the leadership and the followership. There is a disconnect. If there is no disconnect, when people relate with each other mm -hmm. at various leadership level and talk about the community, about the state, about the federation, then we wouldn't have problem whatsoever. They, we don't have core values in the country that everybody depends as all the time. You defend that core value. Mm -hmm. um, core value. You are a Nigerian, this is what you believe in. And anything short of that, you are not going to be, it is not going to be acceptable. I give you, mm -hmm. when we were in the military, we talked about settled issues Very about cool. Nigeria. The unity of Nigeria, as far as we were concerned, was a settled issue. Uh, presidentialism was a settled issue. Um, market economy, free market, mm -hmm. was a, not not socialism, was a settled issue. Um, the federation also is a settled issue. Nobody will come and say, you are with Nigeria is no longer a federation or something. When you say settled issue, are you saying in another way that it's non-negotiable? Because that seems to have, yeah. that's the refrain. Mm -hmm. that's people, but some argue that it should be negotiable. No. That we should sit down at the table. If we decide to be one, then we stay one. If we still want to go our separate ways, why not? No. We decided to be one. How many years ago? About 50, 51 years ago. Mm. And we have been in that position for the last 51 years. Why should we keep on repeating? Uh, let's sit down. You can have not less than five, 100 conferences in this country mm -hmm. that Nigerians themselves sat down and talked about on how to remain one, how to uh, work with the federating units in the country, how to work, operate locally, and so on and so forth. I think we should, there are issues that we shouldn't be talking about them now, but rather... What should we be talking about now? We should be talking about how to encourage, how to strengthen what we have agreed in the last, if you agree, we are going to be united Nigeria since 51 years ago. Mm -hmm. We should now be talking on how to strengthen that unity. If we are going to have a federating unit, we should now be talking about how we want to see our federation. If we want to talk about the local governments, whether they should have free fund, mm -hmm. whether they should govern themselves, 
we should tell them or we should be talking on how this could be achieved. Do you think something similar to the Politburo, which you set up, you know, to give Nigerians the opportunity to explore some of the issues you're talking about. Do you That's think right. Nigeria needs something similar? We've had the 2014 uh, National Conference and so many talk shops. And that okay, have not left I'm anyone. glad you used the word talk shop. That's what it is. You, you went to the shop, you talked, you came back home, abandoned it. And then somebody says, no, 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 we need that conference. Again, it has been done. Political Bureau has laid down everything. But uh, I think the tyranny of the elites is what is the main problem. This is... So what's the way out? The way out. When I told you leadership, mm. the leaders should understand Nigeria and Nigerians. So anybody who wants a position of leadership, you must be a person who will be able to use your intellect for the benefit, if there are things you believe, either in Niger or whatever, and I, I want to lead the state, fine. This is, if you talk about, this is an agricultural state, agrarian state. Mm -hmm. My thought will be how to take advantage of that God-given situation yes. to, bene to better the well-being of the people. Do you think it's just a lack of understanding of Nigeria and Nigerians that's missing within the leadership or just outright lack of love and care for Nigeria and Nigerians? Isn't that what, you know, is possibly missing? From my experience, yes. Nigerians are very resilient people, very, very fertile-minded people. So, if you want to lead them, you have to take a lot of things into consideration. They are very good. They are very resilient. They are very industrious. So how do I put all this together to achieve a common objective? Is that where restructuring, for example, comes in? Because a lot of people say, in fact, some have blamed you as part of the problem in terms of the structure of the present, uh, of the nation presently. You created 11 states. If, if uh, I'm wrong, uh, please correct me. 11 states mm -hmm. during your time as military president. And some say it further alienated the leadership from the followership, the leaders from the people. And you've been quoted as saying that the time to restructure Nigeria is now. If we say restructuring is the way to go, what manner of restructuring are we well, talking about? This is Should it be regionalism or what? No, it's amazingly interesting. If you check from my findings, restructuring means different thing to different people in this country. Mm -hmm. We don't have a common interpretation. That's the first basic problem that we are going to have. What does it mean? We haven't defined it. Mm -hmm. The way I see it is yes. what we started. Which is? Give the people at the lowest level to the highest level opportunity to participate on how they are governed or in, in governance. Um, if I will tell you a story. We had... Uh, Reverend Adasu, may he rest in peace. Mm. He had, um, I had an argument with him. He was a governor in Benue. Uh, one of the local governments was, I think, uh, NRC. He was SDP. Mm -hmm. And he decided he's going to cut his, uh, he's going to stop his uh, funding for the local government. This information got to me, and I called him. He's a very good friend of mine. So I said, Reverend, come, let's talk. We sat down. We said, I said, why did you stop the local government acts in this money? Mm -hmm. He said, no, because he's not in the same party. Wow. I said, look, this man went around the local government. 
He campaigned. He told people, vote for me. I will provide this for you. Mm -hmm. And people accepted that quite Based easily. On that. Pledge on that. It's on that basis, they voted for him. So why don't you give him this money? You hold him responsible. You promise them A, B, C, D. What have you achieved? Because you are on top, you should be able to. They, they are your people. You are their governor. No matter at that place, you have different political beliefs. Yes. He looked at me, he said, uh, I should be a politician. I said, no, Reverend. I would rather be a Reverend. As I said, we are very good friends. But this is the argument. I argued with a lot of my friends. I believe, for example, that I believe in resource control. Okay. But mention it to a lot of people in this country. Somebody will cut your head. Why are you talking? Why don't they want resource control? What do you think is responsible for that? I think it is this belief that this is our own God-given thing in our own environment. Mm -hmm. I want my people to benefit from this. This is our own area. It's all this possession thing. Let me explore that issue of local government that you just talked about. Uh, the current president, President Muhammad Buhari, did sign Order 10, Executive Order 10. The governors frowned against it. I recall that during your term, you actually increased the allocation from 10% to 20%, mm -hmm. if my memory serves me well. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Shouldn't they, don't you think governors at their level really should take a lot of responsibility for the way the local government uh, you know, situation is now? No, this is where you are restructuring comes in. Uh -huh. you, when at the state level, I want to see a situation where the governor is there. The constitution defines his areas of responsibility. Mm -hmm. It defines his powers. It, so at the local government level, at the local government level, anything to do with the governance, the state governor doesn't have to. But if it comes to something bigger, mm -hmm. Like um, during some disasters or whatever, the state can come in to help the local government and that sort of thing. And the laws are there. I saw somebody was talking about the concurrent list and exclusive list. Yes. That is something along that line. I am not a lawyer, I have no idea whatsoever, but I think you should give people more within their capability, give them more control, control over their affairs, over their resources. Would you say then, would you connect the structure of the polity to the dismal state that the Nigerian economy actually finds uh, itself? I recall under your uh, eight-year administration, when you just came in, you introduced SAP. And one of the objectives of SAP, of course, was to, uh, you know, look for ways of diversifying the Nigerian economy, away from our dependency on oil, you know, uh, bring about inclusiveness, you know, bring in more people. You liberalize the economy. Nigeria is still grappling with the economy struggling to keep the dollar stable, for example, which was, of course, what, one of the things you wanted to do with SAF, you know, stabilize uh, Forex. We're still where we were when you were in government. What do you think is responsible for that? And how can Nigeria fix the economy beyond this, uh, you know, what some would describe as uh, panic mode? Yeah, that's the right word, I think. Panic mode. I think is. The consistency in the policy, we ought to be able to say, yes, this is the right thing to do, and keep it going. Not to be dissuaded by other people's opinion. If you believe in the right thing, pursue it. But keep on explaining it to the people also. Or we insist in this because of this. Maybe one day they will get fed up and say, go ahead and do it, or become even more informed. Mm. What do you make of the fact that Nigeria 
imports a huge percentage of uh, petroleum products. The refineries, four refineries, continue to be moribund. What do you make of that? Can we really extricate ourselves from oil if we don't fix the fundamentals at that level? I believe the Nigerian, the Nigerians are very, very industrious. They are very resourceful people. There is nothing they cannot be able to do, and they will do it well. So I am confident they can get out of this uh, inconsistency in policies and the rest of it. What do you make of this administration's handling of the economy so far? <laughs> the fact that is it hasn't collapsed. So I think they are trying to keep it moving. They're trying to keep it moving? Yeah. What are the things, the indices that you would say are the things they are putting in place to actually move the economy forward? I think you need to mobilize the people towards achieving this common objective. You should convince them, or you should prove to them they can do it, mm -hmm. the resources are there, you are there to provide the leadership, and to support them. Are you concerned that the Naira, <laughs> side by side, the dollar is about 550 presently as we speak? What does that say to you? Hmm. It says a lot. But I think we can address it. How? Production. Once people can produce a lot of things that they can easily sell, mm -hmm either export or within the country, I think it will stabilize. But how can that production come about? I mean, you have an unemployment rate of about 33%. You have a huge youth population, almost 70% of the Nigerian population is made up of the youth. And yet Nigeria is the poverty capital of the world. There is too much control in the way the economy is being run. We should open it further. Okay. If we do that and t tap the God-given talent of the Nigerian, I think we will go far. Mm. Beating any built-in solution with smarter AI and customization options, expert... Let's me back up a bit, back to the issue of security. I'm not sure you have helped us understand how we can, you know, pull out of uh, the jaws of terrorism, banditry, and all of that. Mm. What would be your recommendation? For would it be in terms of is there a need to train the military? Is the military overwhelmed? You know, and all of that. And some people would even argue that the involvement of the what of the military not overwhelmed, okay. but maybe overstretched. Okay. Um, the military. I believe has the wherewithal to change, to fight this banditry and uh, bring the system back. But I think the problem is they are doing too much. They are overstretched and subsequently because of the space they have to occupy, they have fairly obsolete equipment but one of the most important thing which we shouldn't lose sight of the military must believe in what they are fighting for they must be provided with the wherewithal to meet up that objective for the country and then um, he must be well trained and well led. And Do you think leadership is what's missing at that level? Is what? The military? Is that what is missing? I think they should do more. From my experience, mm -hmm. they should do more. Right, Your Excellency, let's talk about Nigeria's democracy. I'm not too sure that, you know, where much has been said about the role you played in midwifing uh, this fourth republic. 
uh, I recall in 1999, you know, before the elections, before uh, democracy, you were the forefront of getting uh, now former President Tolusha Gumbasanjo to, you know, take over the helm of affairs. Why was that necessary at the time? And would you say that you're impressed so far with the democratic trajectory that Nigeria finds itself in right now? If there is, <clears throat> was, excuse me, one Nigerian who passionately believes in Nigeria, it is Olisha Gobasanjo. I will give that to him. Mm -hmm. He believes very strongly in this country. So it's easy for us to conclude that the person who will take over must have those core beliefs, beliefs in the oneness of Nigeria and beliefs in its stability for the future development of the country. So that is the one reason why we sold him to Nigerians. Then he has the experience he has seen it all, took part in the war of keeping the country one and uh, lead, or led the country for political engineering and development. Mm, but some would say that it was uh, an attempt to assuage uh, certain uh, sections of the country because of the events of the immediate past at the time. Well, I think... And the way of the, the class of 63, <laughs> to which you belong, you know, to continue to have a hold or a grip on Nigeria. No, I think we... we what, what was happening, we always believe the person who should run the country must have the following um, antecedents, mm -hmm. you know. If he doesn't believe in Nigeria, we wouldn't look for him at all because we wanted a Nigeria. And this is what we kept on saying. Even if it is democratically elected or militarily imposed, he must have that core belief belief in the country and experiences over the years in leadership, in public service and the rest of them. And how many administrations since then? Uh, are you impressed with our democracy so far? Is it delivering? And I'd also like to know what role you're playing with the PDP. I mean, the, the PDP held on to power for uh, 16 years. You're a founding father of uh, the, the PDP. And many are saying, with this administration, Nigeria seems to be moving towards uh, a one-party state. Um, talk to us about that. But I know the Nigerians will not allow that to happen. They will make so much noise that whoever will attempt to do that will not do it. This is the good thing about this country. They will talk, they will demonstrate, they will engage you in all sorts of things so as not to do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Are you still in partisan politics? Are you still very involved in the PDP mm. as an opposition party? No. Why is that? Um, I'm an old, old, elder statesman now. Absolutely. I definitely agree with you totally. Uh, but we cannot... Um, talk about Nigeria's politics without mentioning the fact that when you were, you know, president, military president, you came up with two political parties, the SDP and the NRC. That's right. And, and I still maintain it the best thing for the country. Where, where we are now, it seems it's still, that's, that's what it is. Organically, though, Nigeria has become a two-party state. But like I mentioned earlier, it's tilting towards a one-party uh, state. What was it that you saw that made you create two parties at the time? Because we had, we used the experiences we had. We set up a committee to tell us why things went wrong. Mm -hmm. Democratically, the political parties were not coming up fine. And it was very revealing. 
Look, if you look at the First Republic, we found that up to after the First Second Republic, everybody in this country tend to gravitate towards two-party system. You had Abga, you had NNA, you had all sorts of things. There were a lot of other parties, but we all gravitated towards two party. So we had no difficulty in insisting that two party is the best thing for us in the country. Mm -hmm. And it happens even now. You had what, 70 something, but nobody is talking of them now, it's APC, PDP. You had during uh, Murtala's um, time, or during Obasanjo time, mm. we came up with uh, five, I think. Yes. All gravitating towards two party. So Nigeria can do well with a two party system. So we concluded that and settled. And certainly, this is a settled issue. Let's make two party system. So you're happy with the way it's evolving now organically. Let's talk about 2023, still a couple of years uh, down the road. So much has been said about the need to give a sense of belonging to you know, every part of the country, including the Southeast. Many are saying, come 2023, because the perception is that the Southeast has not had a fair share of you know, being at the helm of affairs. What are your thoughts on the issue of power shifting to the southeast or the need for it to shift to the southeast? Well, I, we, we, we have to make a choice. Either we want to practice democracy the way it should be practiced or the way it is being practiced, or we define democracy in our own whims and caprices. If we are going to do it the way it is done all over the world, you allow the process to continue, but it is through the process that you will be able to come up with a candidate that will lead the country. His qualifications, his beliefs should be known to Nigerians before somebody ever throws his hat into the into the ring into the ring regardless of where he comes from are you saying regardless are you of saying, where he comes are from are you saying that nigeria at this time should jettison the idea of zoning or power shifts and all of that whether we do it now or we don't we will have to do it time will come when somebody will emerge in this country he is from ukwila or from mina the thing is, he is known, everybody knows him, everybody tends to accept what he believes, uh, and then if he throws his hat in, say, oh, yes, I had that name up before, why not? I, I have started visualizing a good Nigerian leader. Who is that? A person who travels in this country and be, has a friend virtually everywhere he travels. He knows at least one person that he can communicate with. A person who is very vast in economy uh, because of the development. And then a good politician who should be able to talk to the Nigerians and so on. I have seen one or two or three already. Young, middle-aged, elderly? 60s. In their 60s? Yeah. You think that person should emerge in 2023? I believe so, if we could get him. So what do you think about this irredentist secessionist um, sentiments coming not only from the southeast, but also from the southwest? There is a general situation with uh, Namdi Kanu and uh, Sunday Boho, who have been championing uh, the cause of their part of the country. Do you think it's a good thing? For, what are your thoughts about that? Well, my thoughts are... Uh... It's always good to agitate, but because there is this belief that this country should be one, when he makes, when they make the noise, they find that it wouldn't get supported because 
Nigerians generally don't believe in anything that will disturb their peace of mind. They wouldn't do it. What do you make of, uh, let me ask you this, because I mean, I, I would not be happy if I didn't. Uh, the DSS has been in the eye of the storm. You created, among so many institutions, Thank the you. SSS, mm -hmm. uh, the NDLEA, NAFTA. I mean, so many that, you know, the NDE... For the, the purpose Directive, of society. Yes. And, of course, the, the uh, intelligence agencies that you set up, like the NIA, SSS, of course, were supposed to, uh, you know, uh, help address the issues of insecurity and all of that. But what do you make of the DSS that has evolved uh, from that, that seems to uh, just have a mind of its own? You know, would not obey court orders and all of that. What, what do you make of today's... Um, you know, security service? Well, I, I think they are fairly well trained and uh, as far as the flouting court orders are concerned, I don't think it is the right thing for them to do. They should obey court orders that's why we we have we ought to have strong institutions, mm -hmm. but institutions that obey the due process. I don't share the flouting of court orders at all. Mm. And speaking of institutions, strong institutions, the EFCC is one of the institutions, uh, you know, with a job of uh, fighting corruption. Uh, there have been question marks on its ability to fight corruption uh, to its standstill. And in addition to that, um, I'd like to get your reaction. How do you feel when you hear uh, from certain quarters sometimes that under your administration that corruption actually thrived? Uh, is that a fair assessment? Corruption is what? Thrived under your administration. Well, that's... You can't compare it with the fact on the ground now. We, you can say it, from what I read, from analysis, I think we are saints when compared to what is happening under a democratic dispensation. Mm. I sacked a governor for still, for misappropriating less than 300 and uh, 13,000. Naira? Yeah. Today, billions are there on the street, those who have stolen billions and are in court are now parading themselves in the street. So who else is better in fighting corruption? So what's your assessment of this administration's uh, war on corruption? Because it's one of the three major plans uh, that it came to power. Oh. That's where politics comes. The, somebody now will come and say, okay, APC1, it made the promise that on three planks, Nigerians voted for them on three planks. Economy, corruption, and security. Mm -hmm. So it's for the others, or for the Nigerian to decide, have this been met? As a Nigerian, would you say, what would you say? I will rather wait and see what the other party, how they react. If they convince me that they, they didn't succeed in this, and they show me proofs, I will go for them. Um, by the way, What's your relationship like with the current President Muhammad Buhari, considering the fact that uh, you were involved in the coup that, you know, uh, ousted him from power? Our relationship is still very good. And uh, I, I am happy. We relate good. Mm. But the seeming bad relationship with the creation of few well, people. Of the media? Yeah. Now, let's even talk about the media. I recall that um, under your time, or in your time, there was this seeming no-love-loss relationship between 
uh, your government and uh, the media. And we seem to find ourselves in that same situation. As a matter of fact, you did abrogate, fair enough, you abrogated Decree 2 and Decree 4. Today, the media is contending with another Decree 2, Decree 4 in another guise. There's a press council bill that, well, it's just been thrown out, but there, there are attempts to stifle the media in the eye of the media, of course. What exactly is it about the media that makes governments fear the media? I didn't fear the media. I liberalize you, don't forget. Today you have private televisions, private newspapers, and so on. So I have no fear with the media. I believe they are an essential part of the society and they should play the role for the society. I had no problem with the media whatsoever. Mm. But what do you make of uh, the seeming clampdown or attempts to clamp down on the media under this administration? The media and the public will not allow that to happen. So it is even silly to start to think of clipping them. I said Nigerians are wonderful people. You, you cannot intimidate them. Mm. Let's talk about you. If you turn 80, uh, I, I, I recall, you know, having a smile on my face when I read uh, something that you did during the war. You got married in 1969 and right barely five months, you went back to the war front because the war, the civil war, the Nigerian civil war was mm -hmm. raging at the time. What made you do that? And of course, I'd like you to talk about why Marian Babangida, then known as Mayor Nokogu, was your choice. Okay. The story was this. In 1969, I was wounded in Uzokoli. Um, I think it's Abia or Imo, I don't know. Mm. Uzokoli is Abia, it's part of Abia. Abia, okay. So I was lucky, I got to Lagos. I was flown on that same day, which is very unusual, but God is kind. And uh, General Gawang got married around that period, April, May. Okay. And uh, here I was a military, my commander in chief. And I was very impressed with the way the marriage was going on and so forth. The first thing that struck me, because I was in a hospital bed, mm. I said, by hell, I could have been dead. So I wouldn't be able to be a married man just like my commander-in-chief was at that time. Mm. So I made up my mind, I will get married the moment I get out of this hospital bed. And God was kind, I got well. I came back, so getting married became my first priority. Hmm. That's it. And you met you met her? You I met knew her. Okay. Before you got wounded. Yeah, that's right. Hmm. I was very frequent to their house. And uh, her brothers, her cousins are all very friendly with me. So when I asked, there was no opposition whatsoever. Wow. And many years later, until of course... A few months later, we got married. Mm -hmm. When you were president, of course, you came up with a better life for rural women. And that seemed to have marked some kind of, uh, uh, you know, entry points for women involvement in, in governance. Uh, tell us more about that. I think what went for her... She worked with some of the best brains, women, in this country. And they were really, really um, committed to uplifting the status of the women in the, in the country. Some of them in the universities, some of them in the public service, they were always working. What do we do? How do we do it? And... Uh, Mm. That was the secret behind the success. Mm. And 
unfortunately you lost her in 2009 not just you nigeria actually lost thank you a, a, a regal uh, woman how has it been since then because you, you didn't remarry why <laughs> they don't like my face the are you sure that's the reason why? <laughs> <laughs> No, well, I think it's it's not easy. That is the way I am. Mm. And you had four children uh, together. Yeah, very nice kids. Yeah, you, I, I mean, I could say so too. <laughs> I have met Aisha and, you know, lovely lady. A lot of people have described you as a, a great builder of men. And women, of course. Um, what exactly was the motive? Was it to earn their loyalty? Because the hilltop here is a mecca of some sorts. Anybody who wants to become president, uh, you know, s sees it as a duty to visit you, to consult with you. But he doesn't become... Whatever they wanted to, you know, whatever they want to be, they, they think they need to consult with you. What exactly is it about you that attracts people from everywhere, from all over the world. I feel comfortable wherever I am, whether in Mina or in Lagos. And uh, I quickly make friends. I don't, and people, I don't disown people, even those I know very well. Yeah. I don't disown them. I stick with them. I think I will say that is the main reason. How would you like to be remembered? What would you say your legacy, you know, is? And before we round up on this discussion, do you have any regrets, whether in terms of the role you played when you were president? Uh, have you had closure on some of those things that seem to be a dark shadow over the great achievements, you know, that you scored under your presidency for eight years. What are those? Regrets? Yes, if any. Now, having left office now for the last 28 years, I do think that, come to think of it, I think we were right here. A lot of things are happening. Mm. And those things convinced me that after all, we didn't do badly. It's maybe we were not understood. Okay. SAP, for example, you mentioned SAP. Yeah, Structural Adjustment Program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Today, everybody, I told Nigerians the day we, in 1996, when we were introducing SAP, that people who take advantage of what we are trying to do will succeed in life. But those who can't will go under. I said that in 1986. 86. And today, I was proved right. People took advantage of what we did. And today, they are the powers of industry economic uh, gurus, um, they provided, they were provided an, an environment to say what you want, when you want, how you want it, and you don't get shot or locked up in the prison. So with, I think I made a contribution in the society on a way to make the society better. Yes, June 12th has been declared a public holiday in honor of the, uh, you know, MK mm. Wabiola. But it still hasn't given closure. I hope you know that Nigerians don't accept know. that. Yeah, Nigerians still want to know what exactly happened. There was talk about a cabal that, you know, figuratively had it gone to your head and forced you to annul June 12th, <laughs> that you yourself are a victim of June 12th. You want me to be honest with you? Yes. If it materialized, there would have been a coup d'etat 
which could have been violent. That's all I can confirm. It didn't happen. Thanks to the engineering, the Maradonic way we handled you guys in the in the society. But we could that could have given room for more instability in the country. But was it pressure from within the military or outside too? Because it's both. Both. The military, they can do it because they have the weapon to do it. The other, the other part of the society, agitation. Are you still the evil genius? <laughs> did you call yourself that? No, I never or did. The that? media did. Okay, and people call you Maradona. What was that all about? Why, I mean, That's a very good thing about the Nigerian media, about the Nigerian people. You have to anticipate them. I, if you anticipate them, then you live well with them. And they call me evil. I, I marvel at that. Uh, I said there is a contradiction. You can't be evil and then a genius. Okay. Mm. So you have to make up what do you mean by evil genius. Maradona, they said the media, again, I got it from the definition of the media, deft political moves. Mm -hmm. That's what the media described it. On that note, I'd like to say thank you so much, Your Excellency. You are welcome, Ngozi. Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida, Grand Commander of the Federal Republic, GCFR. Thank you so much for uh, your time. Thank you for joining us and we wish you uh, the very best as you mark 80 years. <laughs>